Good afternoon and good evening, and welcome to today's SANS at night talk, getting started in DFIR testing one, two, three with Fillmore. If during the webcast, you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be available for viewing later this week, it can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Phil. Hi, hi everyone. I uh, just want to do a quick check. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, I think so. Okay, let me just get that squared away. Awesome. All right. Hi everyone, I'm Phil. I'm here to uh, occupy your attention for the next, let's say, hour. Uh, I'm not going to try to take up too much longer than that. Uh, I know everyone's probably going to want to get back to their lunch or dinner or wherever you are in the world. Um, but for me, it's lunchtime, it's about one o'clock. Uh, and I um, I wanted to, to talk over this, over this webcast about uh, something that I think is really important when learning about digital forensics and actually working in digital forensics. Uh, and that's why I've called it the talk testing one, two, three. It's about testing uh, to learn, testing to experiment, testing to understand. A bit about me as a background, my name is Phil. I am a digital forensic analyst. I've been working in the field for about 10 years, actually 10 years and three weeks, uh, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, I worked at, in serious major crime for my state uh, law enforcement agency, the New South Wales Police, for about eight years. And then for the last two years, I've been uh, an analyst for uh, what was formerly Flying Co, and is now uh, CyberCX. Uh, which is a, a cybersecurity company that covers Australia and New Zealand and we're kind of expanding into to the rest of the world eventually, I'm sure. So I've been um I've been involved in, in digital presence for quite a long time. And, and obviously when I started, I had no experience. I really didn't know anything outside of I'd done a, a digital forensic class at the university. So I had kind of a bit of a basic understanding of things. And uh I kind of I went into law enforcement and they taught me a lot of things, but I wanted to really expand my knowledge. And by doing uh, a lot of self-research and a lot of testing, I was able to uh, develop into the animal science. That, uh, another thing that I, I, I will touch on a bit later as well is uh, a couple of my other projects that I've listed here, This Week in Forensics and Think the FIR, one of which, uh, This Week in Forensics, some people might be aware of, shares all of this research, all of this understanding that the global community has on the overarching field of digital forensics and cybersecurity. And I think the FIR is where I share my research, my testing. A lot of the time, it's just because my memory is not good. Uh, I will remember some things, I might not remember everything. And so I write it down, I publish it out, and I hope that it helps someone understand. My last... Uh, and this is kind of the sales part. Uh, I'm also a sales instructor and course author. I teach the Forensics 500 Windows Forensics Analysis class, and I'm one of the co-authors for the Forensics 308 Digital Forensics Essentials class. Now available live online and on demand. Um, so these two classes, uh, they work really well together, where the 308 class is about the overarching field of digital forensics. What are the different phases? How do you do some things? And we kind of teach you, uh, we teach people that know very little about how all of this fits together. And we walk through from start to finish, how does a digital forensic investigation work? The Forensics 500 class is much more focused on that analysis component. And where we talk about all the different types of artifacts. So I've taken kind of sections of both of these classes uh, and, and put this talk together because this is kind of a talk geared towards newer investigators, people that are interested in digital forensics and kind of interested in learning about all of this stuff, uh, but don't really know where to start. And the, I guess the, the premise of this whole thing and the uh, TLDR is uh, it's really easy to get started. And as long as you're happy to spend a bit of time, you can actually learn quite a lot on yourself, by yourself, and then supplement that with formal education to really solidify your understanding. So that's kind of why. Why do we do testing? 
Well, it'll help us because we actually have to understand how these things work. We might need to understand it to explain it to a jury, explain it to an insurer, explain it to a client, a regulator. There are so many people that our work impacts that we do need to have an understanding of how these things fit together. And by doing these tests, by experimenting and truly understanding the sequence of events that leads to the way that the data looks will allow us to guide our analysis. Because I know, based on my experience, my testing, my training, that if I do these three things, this will appear in the data. And if I do these three things, this won't appear in the data. And that might be something like reading through documentation, uh, reading through other people's research, reading through code in some instances to really truly understand what is happening on the back end, which may or may not be possible. And I say may or may not be possible because this is a black box sometimes. Windows is getting better at releasing information, but sometimes they don't. And so that's why I'm gonna walk through a few different scenarios where we can just download a VM, use our computer, use our Azure, for example, to actually figure out you know, what, what is this thing doing? Maybe how does it work in its entirety? Or maybe it's just, this is what I understand it to do for the series of things that I have, for the series of things I've tested for. And I like to start with a quote, something full of words of wisdom, I'm sorry, something from someone famous, I guess, Richard Feynman. Okay, I have not <laughs> read this book that is on my nightstand about Richard Feynman, but my understanding of uh, the late doctor was that he was really good at stilling very complex topics about physics and explaining them to his students. And I really found this quote resonated with me because uh, really to understand all of this, we do have to experiment. We have to try what, uh, try to figure out what pieces of information, oh, that's my phone, why like that? Um, what are pieces of information and what things we can test to uh, truly understand what's going on. Okay, so what are the things that we could test? We could test how a system works, how an action we perform will actually affect said data, how we could perform those actions and actually recreate the artifact to say, this is what I did and this is what the result was. And then also the last one, which is actually really important, based on our understanding, based on what we know uh, is contained within our evidence source, our file, disk image, our information, what is the tool showing you and what is the tool not showing you? Something to be uh, quite aware of because some tools will show you some data, some tools will show you all the data. And that is something you really, really need to, to really be aware of when you get really into the weeds of doing the project. Okay, so where do you start? That's the hard part. People often don't know where to start. And it's not that difficult if you've got some of those ducks in the world already. So I've got some examples just on the screen here in icon format, of a variety of different things in digital forensics that make up the thing. There's mobile forensics and computer forensics, there's internet and cloud, there's social media, malware, specific file investigations. We've got at the bottom, we've got emails and audio files and videos and photos, now authentication with that. And then IoT, ICS, you might want to do an aeroplane. I don't know, I'm sure someone's done forensics on an aeroplane in, in a black box investigation, for example. Now, some of these are going to be much harder to start with than others. And for this talk, I'm really just going to be focusing on uh, the computer in the middle. That's why I put the Windows logo on it. But that doesn't mean that if you want to get started in something else, that the same principles can apply uh, with regards to setting the scope of your investigation, setting, you know, what do I want to test? What do I want to understand? Reading up about it, testing and experimenting, writing it down and being completely honest, it is fine to have those limitations. Everyone has limitations with the amount of time and, and expertise they have when doing this research. And so being honest upfront to say, these are the things I tested and this is what I didn't test or what I don't know, 
that is a is a much better way to start all of these types of uh, really your your own self education. Okay, so if we want to start with Windows Forensics, because it's actually one of the easiest ones to start with, um, there's a few things that we need to do to get set up. Now, a lot of people might have a Windows computer that they they have at their disposal, and you may or may not want to use that. There are lots of uh, good reasons to use your own computer. If you're doing malware analysis, maybe don't. Maybe focus on the virtual machine because you don't want to ransomware your computer. But if you were testing uh, some email analysis, for example, you could download your own emails, you could open them up in a text editor and you can start reading. Uh, say you were looking at uh, your internet history and you wanted to say, how does my internet history look on my system? It's great, have your own data and reflect that in your tools so that you can say, well, I know what happened and therefore, you know, this is what happened according to the, the data as well. Um, now, the next two sides of this, the virtual machines in cloud VMs, that's a little bit more on the side of recreation testing. And you might, I mean, you might not have a Windows computer and that's where these two will come in handy. But also it's about having a blank slate that you can reset the factory if you want. You can screw it up as much as you want, not a problem, reset the beauty of virtual machine snapshot, snapshot for example. I'm going to focus on uh, the virtual machines in the middle. Uh, and that's because I found that to be quite simple uh, and it's generally free. The cloud VMs you can use, spin up Azure VMs for very cheap, but that's obviously got a cost to it. The benefit, major benefit of using a, a cloud VM is you, know, you can access it from anywhere, you can shut it down when you don't need it, you can share it with people if you need to. Uh, you can expose it to the internet and set it up as a honey pot. There's lots of things that really segment that and make it really useful, but I'm going to focus on the virtual machine. Microsoft actually provides free virtual machines uh, that are used for Internet Explorer and Edge testing, and you can download versions of Windows 7, 8, 10, I think Server 20 something as well. Um, and so I'm going to actually do all of this using a uh, Windows 10 I think it's 1809, so it's not super uh, up to date, but that's fine too. Uh, and that way, you can actually perform a full examination on one of these virtual machines if you install the right tools. The way that I'm going to walk through this, the rest of the presentation, which I am going to speed through because I've got a lot to talk about, not a lot of time, um, is basically to introduce the concept and then afterwards we'll talk about some tools. Uh, that Sorry, introduce the concept and also talk about some tools. So the first one I want to talk about, it's called file access testing. Now I'm going to do this entirely without tools because the whole purpose of this is really just to get our understanding of one of the, one of my favorite uh, forensic artifacts for file access. And I need to share my VM. If I can share my VM, stand by, okay. All right, so we should be seeing WinDev 2101 eval. Now, we can see here that this um, system will last uh, 61 days, and then we can just download another one if we need to. Uh, it's, th these are just fantastic VMs. They come with some tools for coding, not really going to use them, but really they're just a blank slate, which is an amazing thing to be, uh, be able to use. So one of the things, um, I want to focus on right up front is this poster when it loads. So I said we want to test uh, file access artifacts. And SANS produces these posters. This one, the red poster, as it's otherwise affectionately known as, really covers Windows forensic analysis. And one of the really cool things it does is it breaks down different types of investigations into all the different artifacts. And it gives you a little bit of details about them. So we can see here, if we're interested in program execution, we can go to these places. It's a really great place to start when you're trying to get your head around all the different forensic artifacts. Now we spend the whole week on this in uh, Forensics 500. So I'm really not going to uh, go through every single component, but I want to go down to here, which has file and folder opening. 
And I'm gonna focus on this one right in the middle that says shortcut link file. So these files are, let me zoom in. Can I zoom in? Uh, I will try to zoom in. So while I'm talking, there we go. Okay, shortcut files are automatically created by Windows and they are stored in a recent items folder. That folder is in uh, the user's profile. Each user has its own profile. App data, roaming, Microsoft, Windows, recent. Now, my computer has frozen. I'm trying to do too many things. Okay, so while I'm doing that, I will keep talking. So what we know about this artifact is when we access a file, wow, this is really <laughs> um, Of course, by the way, do a presentation full of demonstrations and things are gonna get very dicey. Okay, so what we know is that our link files can show us uh, that a file, when a file is accessed, uh, or created in some respects, when a file is accessed, a link file will get created. Now, I'm going to try and figure out how to get this unzoomed. And it's just playing with me. Uh, I'll do that. Sorry, there we go. This is why. Um, and so, what we can say, we can do a simple test, which I'm going to try and get working while this is failing on me. I'm going to kill this VM and I'm going to start again. Um, so we can do a simple test. We do a simple test where we can basically open up that directory, that recent directory, and we can access some files. Now, if we access some files, what might that look like? I would love to show you. <laughs> Demo cards are pain. So I'm going to fix this in the back end and keep talking. Uh, so, uh, of course, my computer does. Let's go here, here, of course, quit, and I will keep going. Now, the beauty of being able to, um, <laughs> the beauty of being uh, working in forensics for a long time is sometimes things break. Sometimes you have to fix them. And then when that happens, you have to improvise. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna explain how to test this artifact while I fix this, which is really going to be troublesome. So what we know is this directory, this Windows Recents directory, it's a hidden directory that is created per each user account. Aha, fixed. Okay, we're back. Share screen. And uh, share screen. I think Sam, I need to have access again to share the screen. Share screen. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, we're back. We're back. Okay. Fixed it. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my C drive. And what we know from the red poster is each user in our users directory is going to have a folder called app data. Now, what we can see here in this user directory is that app data folder doesn't exist. That's because Windows hides things from us. And it hides things because it doesn't want people deleting things. And, you know, they do that. So what we can do is we can actually tick the box in our view over here. We can say, I want to see hidden items. And now we can see the app data folder is available. Amazing. Now, I know from muscle memory where to go whether that's something that uh, people develop eventually uh, really is on them. I would, I would recommend remembering some of these parts. It is critical to know these things because tools break. And sometimes tools don't update, they don't show you everything, they hide stuff. But we can see here a series of 
recent items. Now, these are all called shortcut files, and they are very small, once two kilobytes. They do contain data. I'm not going to go into what data they can play, that they contain. This is really going to be focusing on how to create these little files. I'm going to clear this out because that just makes it a bit cleaner. And I'm going to add in this date created as well. Now, the reason I am going to do that is because one of the things that we know from the red poster, I'm not going to open it again because that broke everything. Uh, one of the things we know from the red poster is that the, uh, the mere act of opening a file will create a link file. Now, caveat, we might need to test all these things because it's you know, what type of file? Well, if I open this file, will that maybe create a link file? I'm not going to run this. It's a Windows batch file. And uh, I would suggest people do some testing with this. I'm going to just create a copy of this file. And I'm going to change it to a text file. And now I'm going to open this file. I did nothing. I just opened a file. And we can now see an indication that this file to clean up copy.txt was open. OK, so what else can we say? The folder that it was in, this script folder, well, that was created as well. So we've now got two shortcut files that are created just from the action of opening a .txt file. Now, I'm being very specific. Two, file, two shortcut files were created by the action of opening a .txt file. What would happen if I open the batch file? Will it work the same? Maybe, maybe not. Why don't we test it? So I'm going to actually hit edit. I don't want to run the batch file, mainly mainly because I don't know what it does. But I just want to see what happens if you're doing the exact same thing, opening the exact same file, kind of, in the same program, creates a shortcut file. And it doesn't. OK, cool. So we've learned something. So now we can write this down. We can say the act of creating a link file, a shortcut file, is dependent on the file extension. Not the application that's used, maybe the application that's used, but that we haven't seen that in our tests. What we have seen is that when we open a text file from this scripts directory, we can see it creates this scripts link file and this uh, the file name .txt. Now these actually all end in .lnk. Windows is hiding that detail from us, and that's fine. We spend uh, a good good amount of time on. Uh, it's day three, I think. Maybe they moved to I think it's first thing day three in the 500 class talking about you know, what a link file is and how to parse this information. Now, another piece of useful information we can see that this file was created on 1.22 p.m., which is about two minutes ago. And if I open this file again, I'm just going to hit edit. We can see here that this timestamp updates. This one doesn't. OK, so we've learned something else. We now know that when we open the text file using the notepad application, we will get a link file created on the first time we've accessed that file. And the link file will get modified and updated the next time we update that file. But wait, there's only two timestamps. So what if we open that again? Good question. Right click. Edit. Wait for it. Did it update? Maybe it didn't. Maybe the time was wrong. Not sure. Usually, it's a good idea to wait a couple of minutes. Sometimes it actually doesn't update if you open a file too quickly, and that's way outside the scope of this um, this talk. But something to keep in mind as I go through all this is there are a lot of things that we we know and we don't know. And so what I want people to do is as they're going, you say, all right, we're talking about link files. Write down link files. What information can I find out about link files? What tests can I do about link files? And I'm purposely stopping of explaining everything because some of this 
just requires a bit of experimentation and it needs people to just take that initiative to go and do the reading, do the research. Because forensics is a very fast moving field and there is definitely stuff that sticks around, but Windows 10 changed the way that link files work. And we need to test that to understand it. Now, if I go into another folder and I create a file, which I can't do, um, but if I was going to create a file, I would actually get a link file for that creation event. But what if I wanted to create a folder? What would that do? Well, I created four folders. That's weird. Huh. That's interesting. Didn't in this instance, it didn't create a folder. It probably should have, based on our understanding. So maybe this folder acts differently. I'm not sure. It's something that we'll have to test. Now, if you notice. This folder is a bit different and it's got permission issues. If I go in and out of folders, I'm not getting any link files being created. If I create a file in here, new file, what do I get? New file. Okay, so some more information. And this is where I'm stopping because what I want people to do is write down what they're understanding and then fill in the blanks. What about this? What about this? Because I think that's the most interesting part of doing all of this stuff. How does, uh, how do our action, some simple actions like accessing a file, which people do all the time, how does that be reflected in the data? What can we tell about it? All right. New share, and we're going to go back to the presentation. Hopefully, no demo fails. They've got my one out the way, right? That's how it works. Okay, so, so I've got a few tools of the trade slides. Uh, and so I'm going to introduce a couple of tools quickly, and then we'll go back into to some demo and some testing. One of the early key pieces of in the digital forensic investigation puzzle is the use of a hex editor. Way back before I started doing forensics, that was all you had. Uh, thankfully, we've come a very long way. But that doesn't mean that we can forget about an indispensable piece of our toolkit. And this is a tool that I like called HXP. It's free. The, uh, the developer, it's a labor of love. He, uh, he puts out updates and keeps it working. But thankfully, uh, it's a fairly, I'm gonna say, I'm not gonna diminish his work and say it's simple, but it's a simple to understand and use tool. What it allows you to do is open a file or a disk image or a, a live disk uh, and see what the ones and zeros look like. Now they're presented in hex uh, or and decoded in text, but it really allows us to go through and see what our data looks like. We might even be able to make edits to that data, which is kind of cool. And sometimes we might have to make edits to that data. Now, my opinion is that it's a good idea to open some files and have a look at what those uh, files actually look like underneath. And maybe we might be able to find some really interesting information. Maybe we might be able to identify something our tool thinks is something else. Uh, this is common in basically data recovery, which happens a lot in forensics. And so getting uh, familiar with one of these tools, HXD, for example, uh, can really set you apart because it allows you to actually really get hands-on with the data. Another commonly used tool, and some people will shoot me for saying this, is uh, Access Data's FTK image. And the reason why they'll shoot me for saying this is because it is a free tool put out by Access Data that is a component of their overarching FTK suite. I have not used FTK uh, in a very, very long time. Uh, and so I'm not going to comment on how, how this is a tool. But it's uh, FTK Imager is one of the most commonly used data previewing and forensic imaging tools, despite there being other, maybe better options. And I'm choosing my words carefully. There, it does a lot of things. There are 
they're probably going to be more specialist tools that do better jobs of those things, but it's a free tool that access data puts out. And it's a good tool to teach people on. It's a good tool that someone could easily download from the access data website and open up a forensic image, a CD, an attached image, an attached disk, anything. It allows you to mount those files. You can copy the files out. You can do basic data recovery. You have a look at the hex. It's really, really cool. And so I'm going to take a gamble again with this demo link and uh, walk through kind of some of the things about these tools that I think are fairly useful when you're getting your head around their utility. So I've actually installed uh, both of them here. So we've got FTP Imager and HXD. Where's HXD? Aha. Okay. So we can see, uh, I'll start with HXD just because I can, that if I want to open a file, I can hit the open, open button in the top left hand corner. And let's open that red poster, .pdf. Now we can see a lot of information is presented. And a lot of that is in plain text. Maybe that might be useful. Not sure at this stage. It really depends on what we want to learn. And there are lots of tools that we might be able to find to pull out the metadata, to pull out the different streams of data. There is a whole subset on how file formats work uh, and the types of information you might be able to find out of them. And I'm really not going to go into that. But there's a few things to point out. We can see here that it starts with percentage PDF. It's what's called a file signature. That file signature might be set uh, by a specification, for example. And if we go to the JPEG file format, we can actually see how it all works. And that might assist us if we're doing some sort of data recovery at a later stage, because we can go looking for that file data and maybe pull out some data, which would be really cool. Now, I'm not really going to go into the testing side of things uh, with regards to data recovery. There are lots of data sets available on the digital corporate website where you can run specific tools like photo, uh, photo rec, uh, or you can manually go through and pull out based on your understanding of the file signature, and you can manually recover files. But what I want to actually show in this demo, uh, and I'll load it into FTP Imager, is inbuilt into Windows is a tool called disk management. Now, people have probably seen this when they're trying to troubleshoot why USB doesn't work on their system. But something that Windows has had for quite a while and may be very useful is a feature up in the Actions menu called Create VHD. Now, VHD, the virtual hard disk, uh, and this newer format, VHDX, are super useful when you want to do any sort of file system testing. Now, the reason why I think they're so useful is because you can easily create a new file, and I'm going to make it a VHDX. I'm just putting it on the desktop, and I just call it new. Hit save, and I'm going to call it VH, set, set it to be a VHDX file. I'll make it 100 megabytes, and I'm going to make it fixed size. There's no real reason. I just like to make it fixed size. Uh, it may work better with our tools. I haven't tested it. Now, what Windows has done is it's created a single file, this VHDX file, which we can see in the bottom corner. Now it's uninitialized. That's fine. We're going to right click, initialize this. Uh, we don't need to choose a disk partitioning scheme, but that's another keyword. Maybe you write that down and you say, I don't know anything about what an MDR is. Where do I find information about that? And you might want to pick up Brian Carrier's book on file system forensic analysis. Maybe. Now, I'm, as I said, purposely dropping things. I'm not going down that route, but we could. And we could spend ages talking specifically about the master boot record. That's kind of where we, where I want to leave everyone at the end of this. So I'm going to add, uh, skip the step, sorry. So I'm going to add a new simple volume. 
hit next, and you just follow the bouncing ball. It says how much space do you want to allocate, the full amount. We want to give it the volume P. Now, this is the most important part. Which file system do we want to use? Now, a file system is like a filing cabinet. It allows the operating system to identify where well, the file exists. So when you say, I want to open red poster.pdf, the computer's going to go, all right, well, what do I know about that file? I know it's got this name, got this location. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to get that data and I'm going to present it to you. And different file systems work the same but differently. They all work in the way of allowing you to access a file and present that to the user. But on the lower level, some of them store a lot of information, some of them store a little bit of information. Some of them have a lot of metadata, and some of them barely any. They have file size limitations, they have file volume limitations. There was a whole book, aha, props, whole book written about file systems. And it's still in use as uh, I was using it last week. So if I want to test how a different file system acts, I can very easily create one of these file systems. And maybe I want to delete a file and see how that looks. So if I create, I'll create a FAT32 volume. And now we have a new volume. Amazing. So I'm going to just copy a couple of files quickly. I have so much left I want to talk about. Copy a couple of files. I think I might delete the red poster because I don't want it. And then I'm going to go into FTK Imager, File, Add Evidence Item. And because I've got it mounted, I'm going to call it a physical drive. Now you can see here, physical drive one, virtual hard disk. Fantastic. That's what I'm interested in. Hit finish, and we're in. I can see here there's one petition. Great. That's what I set up. It's about 32 volume. And under root, I can see, wait a second, I deleted this file. I Pretty sure I deleted that file, but it's still there. And uh, it's not showing me anything. But if I right click and I export that file, I might be able to easily recover it. And I'm going to move on to something else now because I just kind of want to leave it there. But that kind of leaves me with a few more questions. Lots more questions than they started with. Well, wait a second. How is that file still there? What what do, what happens when I delete a file? What does the file system do? What does the operating system do? And this is where we start to do more tests. But that's for another time. And let's go back to the new share. I'm going to go back to here. Okay. Another set of tools that I think everyone should have in their toolkit uh, are the easy tools, Eric Zimmerman tools. These will present to you a series of Windows-based, uh, well, a series of Windows-based tools that will parse almost every Windows forensic artifact that we have available. This is where we take our red poster and our list of easy tools and we marry them up. And we say, oh, file access, link files. There's a link file parser. Maybe now that I know where the link files exist, I know how to create them, and I maybe know what they kind of should contain. If I run a parser, maybe I'll see all the different bits and pieces that are found within that file. You might not understand every single component, but that's okay. That's because we're learning. I'm not really going to go through every single one of these. I just wanted to mention uh, two primary ones that you might want to use because you can really easily use these on a live system. I have Shell Bags Explorer. And a shell bag, aptly named because it's a bag artifact within it. Anyway, it's called a shell bag, is an indication of folder interaction. Now, Eric wrote this tool, I think this was one of his first tools, 
And it allows you to show that other piece of the puzzle that we get from our link files. So we saw when we went into folders, we didn't get any link files, but that's because the shell bags are being populated. Now, one of the cool things that Shell Bag Explorer allows you to do is load it up on your test system or a live system or any system and say, I want to see all the shell bags for my current user. And that means that you can easily test to see what data is available. And you might find out that, hey, I plugged in a USB and I went through some uh, folders on that USB and then I took that USB out. But the shell bag information is still there. Now, some people might be thinking, wait a second, what was on that USB? How do I clear out these shell bags? That's great. That's fantastic. Keep thinking about that because there are ways to clear out shell bags. And maybe that's something you want to look into for educational purposes or nefarious purposes or to understand what the nefarious purposes could be or to understand that maybe Windows does it sometimes. That's fine. We're just building out our knowledge as we go. Now, the shell bags are part of a greater, uh, I guess, configuration database called the Windows Registry. Now, the Windows Registry uh, stores a whole bunch of really, really useful information. If I had five minutes on a box and I had to capture as much as I could, I could capture more than just the registry, but I would capture the registry because that's going to have information about program execution, information about user activity, file access, configurations, maybe even persistence mechanism. And it's a really easy artifact to get your hands on because we can use something like Registry Explorer, by example, to load that up on our live system, which is great. Now, I'm going to do a very short demo of this one. And the only reason why I could talk about the Registry for hours, we actually spend a whole day on it on um, in 500, but that's, um, I don't have a whole day. So I'm gonna condense it as quickly as I can. So if we go into our tools, now I've downloaded these, Zimmerman tools. Uh, if you go, if you Google Eric Zimmerman Digital Forensics, this will come up, uh, it's hosted on this GitHub page. And we can just run a PowerShell script or get Zimmerman tools.ps1. It'll download them all, keep them up to date. If I want to load up my Shell Bags Explorer, I can see I load that up, right click, run as administrator. Now I want to run as an administrator because if I don't, I won't be able to see my live system as clearly as if I did it uh, with the administrative access. Now, I guess we got to write some tests. We've got to think about what we, we should expect to see here. Well, we should expect that we're going to see, oh, by the way, hit X. Sorry, Eric. He wants feedback. I'm not getting it to him at the moment. Okay, so what we should see are all of the folders that we've interacted with. And we can see that in this really amazing tree here. So we can see here, I don't know what that E drive is. I don't think I even accessed the E drive. Maybe I did. Oh no, I did. That was the volume I mounted. There you go. That volume is no longer mounted. But there is an indication that it was there. Okay, that's good to know. What if I mount, I'm just writing out questions here. What if I mount another E drive? How would that look? I don't know, test it. The shell bag artifact doesn't really record distinctions, it just says, it was under the E drive. So two USBs plugged in, both given the E drive, you might see, you'll probably see the, set, the folder structure of both all crammed in together and you might not be able to distinguish the two. That's okay. Something to test, something to keep in mind. We can see here that I went into the scripts directory. That's cool. I went into the purplots directory. Ooh, that shouldn't be there. And I know this because I see malware commonly found in perplots, and usually it's an empty directory. And if you see a new folder in there, someone's been messing around in it, and it might not be legitimate. But we, we understand that because we kind of, by spending time in a normal system, stuff that's not normal stands out a bit more. We can see some really cool things, like the modified access and creative times of those files when they were accessed. And here, 
who also got, when I went in, when did I actually access those files? That's pretty cool. Now, the registry, very similar. I'm going to jump into the registry. We're going to go into Registry Explorer. Anytime you see one of Eric's tools ending in Explorer, that's because it's got a GUI version. There's a command line version, which I'm not going to touch. I'm going to, again, run this as, as an administrator. Takes a second to load. What we can do with the Registry Explorer tool is load up both our active and our offline registry. We're not going to really want to do an offline registry uh, when we're testing, but we might. We might want to capture that registry hive and then come back to it at a later stage, which is uh, something you commonly might do. And I'll talk about a, a great tool that you can use for that later. Now, if I want to load up any of these hives, I can see file, live system, and I've got all of these registry hives containing security information. So the SAM will contain information about the users that are logged in, obviously your software and system containing information about software and the system. We've got specific ones for each user. We can see here, there are kind of three users, but there's not really. I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> um, there is the anti-user.bat is a single configuration file that is available for each user account. And what we can do is filter down in here and try and figure out what's going on. Now, this is a hierarchical database. It's kind of like its own file system. Uh, and you can navigate and have a look at all of the different registry keys, registry values, registry data to try and figure out how it's all working. Now, like I said, we spent a whole day talking about all of the different things you can find in the registry. But being familiar with what the registry looks like and what some of the tools look like is very useful. And we can get some, uh, we can draw some parallels again with that red post code because we might say, hey, I recognize this. That says user assist. That's, that's under program execution. Okay, what information can I find out about user assist? Maybe something cool. Maybe we can find an indication of all of the programs that I've accessed with the GUI. And maybe I can tell when they were last executed. So we can see a variety of things. There's my notepad access. There's my FTK imager access. And some of these have no timestamps. What's that all about? Not sure. Maybe we'll have to figure that one out at another time. Oh, right. Move back. Got one more demo that I want to do. I could talk about a lot of this stuff for hours and hours and hours. And uh, unfortunately, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> Sometimes it, it really is because there's just so much, so much to do. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, metadata, but I think we'll, we'll run out of time on that, and that's okay. Um, but a tool to reference is called Exit Tool, really, really useful. And you might be able to pull out some really, really cool pieces of information from, like I showed you before, those PDF files, those Word document files, JPEGs. Uh, and you might want to practice all of this on actual data sets rather than you know creating the data yourself. Now, my opinion, do both. My opinion is going to be take all of the free information that we've put out. Sam puts out so much free information. You know, his webcast, for example. Figure out something that you don't know anything about, don't know anything about read files, don't know what a jump list is, don't know what a user files that that file is, even though I kind of mentioned it, but not really. And that's where we start to figure out how these things fit together, piece all the information that we've got and start learning. Now, two resources that I, I tend to point people to, uh, Digital Forensics uh, Training, DFR Training, and About DFIR, both two fantastic resources that are just big compendiums of information. And they both have uh, web, uh, 
page on their websites that reference data sets. And you can download data sets that relate to kind of investigations that people put together or even specific data sets about specific files. For example, NIST put together, I think it was NIST, put together some data carving uh, images. And it's specifically for the purpose of training and testing upon data carving. Now, if you want to use these forensic images, you can use a free tool called Arsenal Image Mounter. It's premium, it's free, but there are some additional features that you can pay and it's reasonably cheap uh, to pay for a yearly license with them. And it will allow you to mount these forensic images. FTK Imager has a similar functionality, but the preference is going to be Arsenal Imager, uh, Arsenal Image Mounter. Uh, it's just generally, my experience, been a lot better and it gives you access to a lot more data that you didn't necessarily get access to before. And another tool that's really fantastic for learning is a tool called CAPE. Now, CAPE is written by Eric Zimmerman uh, on behalf of his employer, who is Kroll. And if you go to the Kroll website and search for CAPE, you can download that tool. It's free for most use cases. Basically, if you're a consultant, you have to pay for a license, but it's reasonably cheap. It's under $1,000. And uh, the reason why I want to point that tool out, uh, I will not have time to show it, but the reason why I want to point that tool out is it's a fantastic tool for learning where data sits and how to parse it. The reason why it's really fantastic is because Eric designed it to have all of the modules and targets, targets being when you collect a file and a module being how you parse a file, being an open text-based format. So you can go through and double click on every one of those targets and modules, and it will allow us to contain our collective wisdom about where those files are. So it's a really great starting point on how do I get the file? How do I parse it? It doesn't do the analysis for you, unfortunately, um, but it will really allow you, it's a free tool that will allow you to get really close and personal with your data very quickly and learn a lot just based on everything that it's capable of. So kind of the, you know, summarization of everything is, and this is something that happens on a, on a daily basis in, in digital forensics, is maybe not the first part, you don't necessarily get to pick something you don't understand, something will often be thrown at you and say, here you go, figure it out. And that's where you have to read, test, document. There will often be information uh, on Microsoft's website from other investigators, that is published, and that's kind of a, a decent amount of my weekend goes to taking all that information and sharing it out on this week in forensics. But what people are doing is they're, they're reading everything that they can, they're writing it down, they're sharing it. And that allows us all to learn. And sidebar, it allows people that are new into the industry to demonstrate that they're really interested in this stuff and they're actually taking the initiative to do what we do all the time. That's not do forensics, that's figure it out. It is, I've got no idea how this thing works. All right, cool, let's go. Let's run this tool. Let's do some tests. I've got to test remote access. So I've got to install DNC, TeamViewer, uh, any, no, not anywhere. The other one, uh, I, can't, I can't remember at the moment. And look at what those logs look like when I perform that action. What information can I tell? And then they have written it down. Actually, Team Viewer is on top of my mind because that was used last week and a bunch of people started to write that down, write down their analysis of the Team Viewer logs. It's great. It's, it's something that I encourage everyone to do. And then you share it. That's where you, you, you give that information out to the world because it, there's no problem with saying, I tested these things. I had limitations in my testing. I didn't quite understand all of these things and the community does not, I have not seen the community trample on people for sharing, you know, I tested this thing. It doesn't matter if it's, I found, I, I tested user assist for the first time, this is what I learned, that's great. Now, if you say something wrong, hopefully someone will help correct you. But sometimes you might find something that no one else knew about, which has happened on several occasions. Solved problems aren't always solved because new operating systems come out, 
new data is created, new ways of accessing that data might occur, and the data might look different. And so it's worthwhile for everyone when they're doing their research, when they're doing their testing, to take that extra half an hour to take screenshots and write it down and say, this is what I did, these are the limitations, this is what I found. And kind of self-serving for me because you know that's where this quick inferences comes in handy, but mainly because I can't remember everything that I write things down. And that way I can go back and say, what happens when I do this action? What what I remember doing some testing about uh, how copying a file did a thing, how it affected the data, what timestamps were updated, what timestamps were. So that's kind of where I'm going to leave it. I uh, hope everyone has enjoyed my ranting for the last hour. Whoop, it's going backwards. Cool. Uh, ranting for the last hour, tech fails and all, which of course you have to have one. I am uh, going to be here for the next little bit. If there are any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to field them. Otherwise, I am available on Twitter. I am quite active there, at least reading, scrolling endlessly. endlessly. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everyone that uh, came in and enjoyed the talk. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Phil, for the talk. I'll give everyone a couple of minutes to uh, add any additional questions that they have. A couple that have come through, Phil. Uh, where are the best places to sort of share this information? Mm. Yeah, there are lots of places that people do share. For example, people will go on Twitter and say, I found this thing, and that goes off into the ether and you lose it. People will post on forums and, and listservs. It's great to help people that have answer, have questions that way. But my personal opinion is go to WordPress, go to Blogger, go to start your own website, don't care, and create that for yourself because it's an easy way for you to control everything that you are learning and it's an easy place to point people. I have people asking me this question, how do I get started? How do I get started in sharing? And so now I go, go to think the FIR, Dot com, and there is a link on why you should share, why you should get started. There is also a link on This Week in Forensics about tips on starting a blog because that is so much easier to point people to than I think I saw it on Twitter somewhere. Hang on, let me check my bookmarks. Excellent. And that sort of goes to the question as well where would the uh, testing, etc., be published? Look, you can publish in a variety of places. Uh, I, I, you can, people publish in, in journals. That's not for me uh some things are, are much more uh s much smaller than those that would um, publish in a journal so if i if i'm just testing how to do a small subset of a thing that's probably not going to get published what we did uh, a group of us got together and set something up called dfir review which is under the banner of dfrws the digital forensics research workshop and what anyone is able to do is if you publish a blog post that you would like validated, you can actually submit that to the deep peer review process. And we've got a lot of people that have done some really great research that is not going to go, they're not going to put it in a book and they're not going to put it in uh, a journal. And they can go through that process and have other experts look at it and say, I agree with their findings. Excellent. The book that you flashed up earlier, any chance you could share the name of it, please? Post it uh, up in the chat. Yes. Uh, can I probably add it? I don't know if I can access the chat. Hang on. Computers are hard, people. Computers are hard. Uh, answer. Type answer. Um, I, can, I can only see one question at the moment, which is about skills and certification with entry level people. But I will hold it up. File System Forensic Analysis by Brian Carrier. It is uh, an old book now. It's about. 16 years old, I think he published it in 2005. And uh, it is a what is considered a Bible of file system analysis. It is not something I read it from cover to cover. Uh, I would not recommend that, but it is a fantastic reference when you need it. You might not need it all the time. Uh, you might not need to have that level of in-depth understanding of how file system works, but uh, I think it's it's a good book to to have at your disposal. Fantastic.
And the uh, final question that we have there is what skills, experience or certifications do entry level cybersecurity graduates require to break their way into a DFIR role? It's, that's a very hard question. Now, this is a sad webcast. Let me tell you to take sales classes. I do think that they are the best classes that will set you up from start to end on how to conduct a digital forensic investigation. But the caveat there is it also depends on what your background is. So if you come out with absolutely nothing, you have no experience with computing, I'm going to say start at 308. Now, we cover a lot of things that I think you're going to know, you're going to need to know. But there are people that are coming out of uh, university degrees that have done all of the basics of forensic, and that's where you might want really to go into the acquisition and the specific analysis. If you're going to want to start in a SOC, well, that's where you might want to take some of our routine classes. The, the problem overall is that the skills that you need are, you know, in, being inquisitive, trying to do a very comprehensive job at understanding how things work and not, not trusting that sometimes the documentation is always right, sometimes the tools don't show you everything. We hire people, I got hired out of university with no certifications, no experience, really. Uh, but what my employer said they saw in me was, you know, I was interested and keen to learn. When you haven't got that kind of background, that's really what you've got to go off. And so that's kind of the, the skills, experience, and, and certifications is a really hard one because it, a lot of it comes down to you can be, you, I can put you through every single class, but if you don't ingest that information and you don't show that you can use that information, then it, it's not as helpful as someone that knows nothing but is really, really raring to go with this stuff. Perfect. Thank you, Phil. Next one's for me from uh, Frank, and it's inquiring about our SANS work study program. Look, it is very, very competitive to, to, to get a spot in that work study program, but the best thing you can do is contact us here in the in the Australia office at ANZ at sans.org and uh, we can talk through the details of the, the requirements of that work study program. The work study is great. Uh, anyone that can do it, do it. That's how I got into um, 408 the first time when it was 408, now 500. And uh, it's it's a good experience if you can get into the work study. I mean, our classes are fantastic and I'm biased to say that. Uh, and that I, I appreciate they're expensive, but I really think you get what you pay for. You really get your money's worth out of it. Wonderful. Um, quick last question. Is there any other websites that can be used as data sets and learn how an investigation is done by professional and be able to learn from them? Um, the, those two websites, about DFIR and DFIR.training, they are compendium websites. So they actually... Both uh, the people, the group of people that runs about DFR and Brett Shavers who runs DFR training, they scour the internet whenever a new data set is put up and they'll present, uh, they basically just list it in a table. And what's really cool about some of these data sets is that people write up what they find and you can find them. Uh, it's the same with CTFs. There have been some CTFs that have been running uh, throughout, especially throughout last year, I think there were about three or four, and people are writing up how they're doing the uh, doing all these questions and answers, and, and I've been doing that for some of the CTFs I've been competing in. So there, there's plenty of places, and honestly, Google is my friend. Google is everyone's friend. Well, not the Australian government's friend, but everyone's friend at the moment. You can just find so much information at your fingertips about how to get started in forensics, how to get data sets, how to parse data. Uh, what data means. And, and I think going to my website this week in forensics and the other two I've listed, uh, deep into training in the data fire are fantastic places to start. Perfect. Thank you very much, Phil. Look, thank you all for uh, joining in. We greatly appreciate you listening today. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. You can find your CPEs for all completed webcasts by logging into your SANS portal account, navigate to your account dashboard, then click My Webcasts. You can then download your CPEs on the right-hand side of the webpage. Until next week and next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Thanks, Phil.
Okay, guys, I'm going to end the session now, okay? <laughs>